Okay, so good evening again, uh, bonsoir à tous et à toutes, and welcome to tonight's presentation of OTF Connex, titled Towards a Pedagogy of Playful Mathematics with Matthew Aldridge. Uh, we have a relatively small group tonight, uh, which is always um, a great opportunity for participation. I know that Matt has, uh, Matthew has prepared a, a particularly interactive session for us tonight, so don't hesitate to submit your ideas and, and questions in the chat box throughout uh, Matt's presentation. Uh, Matthew and I have worked together on a um, few OTF Connect sessions in the past, and it's always a pleasure for me to uh, moderate with him. Um, as usual, I also would like to thank you all for taking time away from your families to meet us over OTF Connects and uh, share your ideas and experiences. Uh, comme d'habitude, je voudrais profiter de uh, l'opportunité pour souhaiter la bienvenue à nos collègues franco-ontariens. Uh, cette session est en anglais, mais si vous désirez obtenir des informations en français, surtout n'hésitez uh, pas à me contacter par la suite. Um, we are definitely thrilled to have each and every one of, of, um, of you with us tonight, and it's also our absolute pleasure to welcome Matthew Aldridge. Um, as uh, many of you uh, already know, Matthew is a resource teacher of mathematics in the alternative program of the Peel District School Board. Um, over the years, Matthew has become well known for his uh, conferences and, and presentation. He also does uh, TED Talks and webinars with, uh, with, with us, with OTF Connects. He's also well known for his famous one-line resume. Um, I always uh, say that it's something he probably picked up because he's a very avid Twitter user. So, um, in his own words, this is how Matthew likes to be introduced, and I'm going to open virtual quotation marks here. Matthew is a father, educator, TEDx speaker, thinker, writer, and tweeter. Close quotation marks. So, um, that's, I think, how he likes it, very short and sweet. And uh, so, at this point, um, let's jump right in. Matt, if you are uh, ready, yeah, I see that you've clicked on your microphone already, so go ahead um, with, with your presentation. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here tonight. So, I intend to do a playful session as, as per the title. And just to really get you thinking, some of the other sessions I've done um, for OTF Connects, if you've done any other ones, have been a little more technical. Like last time we did uh, pro uh, progression of, um, you know, the landscape or continuum of early number sets, from counting to adding and subtracting. And we've also done spatial reasoning. This one's less technical, and it's more about how we think about mathematics. And so there's some takeaways. Um, I like to stuff it full of links for one thing, so those are some takeaways, and some takeaways that are task ideas, but I think most of all this mentality of making mathematics playful. Okay, on the first note of sharing things, you have all these slides already. Uh, if you'd like to use them, just make a copy into your Google Drive. Uh, I always have to give the slides away, because it's 2018. Right, so I like to say that math is play, and I like to say that it is playful, and or at least it can be more playful than we often tend to make it. I'm not saying you don't, but I didn't 15 years ago, and I'm just learning how to do so, and that's what this session is about. Just, and so reaching towards that pedagogy, I mean, there's a lot of pedagogical things that we might find maybe a little more complex or might require more um, complicated frameworks. But I think in the teaching and learning of mathematics, if we give interesting tasks and we let kids think and play with them, great things will happen. Okay, so you're going to notice in the chat box a lot of links will be coming up. I'm a reader myself and I like to save things. And so I stuff all these sessions full of links for the participants. So I wrote a piece basically with this title called Math is Play. And I also directed you to my website. Sorry, I directed you generally to Medium where I often um, write about math education. Yes, links are awesome. On that note, there's a couple coming up. I included the Math is Play TED Talk from Kitchener last fall. And it was fun. I threw a bunch of stuff on the stage because I wanted to make some points. 
And so I wanted to make some points about how math can be playful. That was the title of the talk. And you could choose to watch or not watch that on YouTube. There's some extra playful bits of math you can play with. Then there's a five-minute link coming up to um, OAME Ignite. Same topic. I was just developing the idea. And you could choose to watch or not watch those videos as you feel like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There it is. And so, you know, in looking up this topic, you get a lot of things about the early years. And I believe I've included um, uh, one link later tonight. But, you know, the early years, we tend to think of learning through play. And then we just kind of put that away. It's like, oh, well, kids are in grade one now. Time to get serious, you know, time for some academics, right? And I just think that playfulness has to decrease. And it decreases through, you know, grade six, seven, eight, and then it decreases through high school. But it doesn't have to. It really, really doesn't have to, and that's what I want to talk about. Okay, so the first one's that TEDx talk. I do things like pull socks from a drawer on the stage, throw some dice, throw some cards, you know, and um, the the other thing I wanted to say by way of introduction tonight, there's a few things that, yeah, they're kind of like task takeaways, but here's what I find about a lot of professional sessions. You go, and there's one good task, you take it, and you do it, and that's it. And that's good for what it is, but I'm trying to get you thinking about if you really engage with the ideas of mathematics, you will always have tasks. <laughs> so you'll always be thinking about interesting math, really get to know it. Um, so I'm trying to get to the, the things I talk about, I'm trying to get to the ideas behind it. Um, because I found that the more I knew about mathematics, the deeper I got into the ideas, well, teaching it certainly got easier. And so, without pulling out a calculator, can you compute this? This is from Mar Martin Gardner. You can put the answer in the chat box when you've computed this gigantic number. Okay, we have a couple answers coming in. And so we know that there is some some trickery there. Um, but instead of trickery, if we were just to take the first five numbers, put brackets around them, you know, and just let's just think of associativity. Let's just multiply that whole thing. Let's pretend we're a computer and we have to multiply those five things together. We have some giant number. It's going to be in the millions for sure, hundreds of millions. I don't know. And then we just multiply it by zero. Isn't it nicer to notice the zero at the end, first of all? And I think that uh, kids, we have computers to compute, and kids need to know their basic computations. But uh, more so, we need them to, to look at expressions like this and say, well, that's, that's nonsense. It just zeroes out in the end. And then this, that's a really powerful thing to notice. Um, so that's... Uh, yeah, copy and paste. Feel free to go away and look at look at any links that come up. For me, I find these webinars. It's like you gotta run it through your own workflow. So listen to me, pop up the link, read something. You know, it's just it's just how it is. It's 2018. Um, so it's nice to notice that that goes to zero. So Martin Gardner was uh, famous. He wrote uh, hundreds hundreds of things like that uh, for Scientific American. He sadly has passed away now. A little bit of uh, algebra trickery to play with. So I've done this one live in front of, you know, parent audiences. So do it now. Double, uh, think of a number. Double that number. <clears throat> and now multiply that by 5. Oh, I, I just forgot for a second how this one works. Oh, no, I know. Yeah, okay. I'm just going to get everyone. There's, there's really no pressure here in this environment. Just, like, double check. Uh, double check. So take it, double it, then multiply that result by five. And it should be. Oh yes, I forgot how my own trick works. Okay, so that was actually a total brain freeze after a long day. So now I'm going back. So, um, so, 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 so. Kathy's original number was six. And Karen's was 5, and Emily's was 5, and Caroline's was 10, and Sabrina's was 5, and Jen's was 2, and Melanie's was 12, and so on. And so now you can see sort of behind the curtain. Ooh, 
nine hundred thousand. Okay, that's intriguing. So I should still just go okay. That one should be ninety thousand. We started with. <laughs> so and um and I'll give you the number. And so there's a lot of this stuff out there. It's truly not magic. It's mathematics. More specifically, it's algebra. I picked this one. There was something really simple disguised that it's just 10 times a number. And I, the only reason I picked that um, so simple is so I could do it in front of live audiences. But um, there's so many of these. And I've even seen with, with the grade eights where I've got them to, um, you know, they, have, they know enough algebra that they can make their own. And they like to try and trick each other, you know. And so they just see behind the, the curtains, uh, and the Wizard of Oz is not there, just some algebra. So consider some number, call that number n. Double that, we could call that 2n, 2 times n. Multiply that by 5, and you're at 10n, or 10 times your original number. But I just know I can remove the n0. So that's the trick that allows me to do it on the spot. Oh, yes, and I've included some algebra tricks. So playing with the structure of algebra. Now I'm going to get you to think about our curriculum. And so where grade 6, we might say, oh, well, this is a variable. This is a constant. Let's graph the pattern. Grade 7, uh, extend out to the nth term. Maybe solve something simple like x plus 3 equals 10. Start to think about balancing grade 8. Something like 2x plus 1 equals 9, probably no negative integers. And then we'll give them, you know, some of those word problems that require them to use algebra. But aren't really always that motivating. So this is just something you can try. You know, and it's just playing with structure. So mathematics is about structure, and we can get kids playing with, with structure. Uh, this became one of my favorites. It's actually the, the first problem in the Martin Gardner book I have that I found at a used bookstore. So I have to say, in this case, it was black and white because that's what was available at the dollar store that day. In Martin Gardner, I think it was red and blue. So two colors. And I say to you, it's dark. I'm reaching into the drawer. How many pulls to guarantee a pair? And uh, I'm going to get you to think about that one uh, for a second. So you know if you pull one, that can't possibly be a pair. That's a yeah, it doesn't say they have to match. Oh, okay. Well, in this that case, the answer would be two. So let's then specify that they have to be of one color. So how many pulls to guarantee two of one color? We say two, we say three. Remember, guarantee, though, is something quite specific. So now I'm remembering Twitter conversations about this. <laughs> so, but we say two, and I want those people to answer two, and like just to push your mathematical thinking, if it's dark, you're looking. I pull the first one, it's white or black. Sure, set it down. Pull the second one, it's white or black. Do we feel that's a guarantee? So draw a tree diagram in your head. Consider that you have either um, black, black, white, white, black, white, or white, black. So is it actually guaranteed? Oh, and how many socks are there total? I think I actually put 20 in the drawer. But we only care about one pair because it's, it's just us. Um, and then so, oh, yes, equal. And I, I think, yeah, so there would be equal 10 and 10, which really, truly matters. And so in your framing of this sort of problem, I, I think you want this sort of um, thinking classroom where kids are going to ask these kinds of questions. And then so for Gen W, that's one of the common answers, but it, that would actually guarantee um, white or black if we wanted it. So in other words, the actual answer is, is definitely lower. But I'm, I feel like I know your reasoning. Uh, the worst case scenario is mismatch socks. 
Yeah, how many will you have to draw before you get a pair? I think we're highlighting here is that we do need to talk about our problems. Problems. So we do need to talk about our problems. And so we need to get kids the information they need. So if I'm too imprecise, then we should um, reformulate it. Yeah, you only pull one at a time. And this is where I think this sort of problem can lead us astray because we can overcomplicate it, which may be why it was first in Gardner's book, because the actual answer is a little simple. And so a few people did have it, actually. But don't feel bad if you didn't. The sort of thinking, which is really mathematical thinking, is not always easy initially. And so we want a class, type of classroom where whatever grade it is, they just have to know some basic probability or um, a tree diagram or like just the pigeonhole principle where if I have uh, an empty box for the first one, just draw an empty box, say, okay, that has to be white or black. Second box has to be white or black. No guarantee. Go to the third box. There's always a scenario where um, I have two that are the same. So three is actually the answer. Yeah, assuming we want to match. So kids would be curious about that. And it's simpler than you think it probably would be. But you can draw a tree diagram. Um, lately, I've taken to visualizing an empty box. Okay, just just like a pigeonhole or like a mailbox, right, in your staff uh, staff staff room. So the first one's empty. It has to. I have to put a white or black in it. And regardless of what I've done, the second one has to get white or black. So there's no scenario where it's guaranteed after two, but the third one guarantees it. So and I'm thinking about filling that box with one thing, but that's just one way to do it. Okay, and so you could reformulate how many pulls to guarantee a white pair. Um, it slips my mind, but the answer is 11 or 12, and I think that's what I think it was Jen was on to up above. Okay, and so, yeah, I like to think that we have the sorts of classrooms where we can give this sort of problem to kids and they'll engage with it. I've seen, and this would be frustrating, but I've seen where we go to a classroom and someone will say, well, it's... That's not the unit we're doing right now. But we want thinkers and we want players with mathematics. And if we build the right kinds of classrooms, they they will want to um, they will want to um, play with this sort of problem. This one I actually because I had to remember if you watch that video I had the drawer on stage. You can dramatize the drawer. That's your manipulative socks, preferably clean ones, and um, just. Try it in your classroom. Yes, absolutely. Make sure they're clean. And um, yeah, the black and white didn't look as good. Maybe we'll go back to the dollar store and get some different brighter colors. Uh, spatial play. I just highlighted Lego with one of my sons. And so there's this indisputable link between spatial sense in the early years and number success in mathematics, a number in particular in the later years, and that's one sort of set of studies. And typically they were looking at things like mental rotation of something like a five cube object, not something like it. That was the classic study in I think the late 70s. And so they know that space and number are connected. When I say space, moving objects in space, building with blocks, <coughs> doing jigsaw puzzles is connected to numbers. And so if you use open number lines as a tool in your classroom, that's space. That's space on the line. And we're dividing up that space and we're marking up that space. And so a power, an open number line is definitely a powerful tool. That's one connection right there. But otherwise, they don't even know the exact mechanism. But I've heard it phrased that there's indisputably a link. Like indisputably a link, and so like we're we're really are justified with uh, playing, and this is beyond kindergarten. I still have a kindergarten son. They play all the time, but this is beyond that. Okay, spatial play is good for all grades, and then play with numbers, as we'll see. Um, so we shouldn't be afraid of that. Uh, Lego itself is one of the the most powerful. Uh, 
tools for this for sure. Right, I think I just dropped the slide off somehow. So I'll try and pull it back up. Uh, Michelle, if you're listening, Michelle, I seem to have lost the slides from the main screen. Do you slide missing? Um, yes, it's just gray now. Hold on, I, I, I don't have a problem. What do you mean it's just gray? I can, I can see the, the slide properly on my end. I don't know, it's, it's gone gray oh, on your okay. side? Oh, did I change my view? The page. Maybe you have to make sure that it says fit page at the top. Uh, okay, so you went, okay, that's what you did. You, you went to application sharing. Oh, no, oh. you went to web tour. You're starting a web tour. So click on the little squiggly just to the left. The little squiggly next. Yeah, like that. Sorry, I just did something dumb. So I went to application. Yeah, you, you want to do an application sharing right now or not? That's you? That? Okay, we've lost Matthew. Uh, okay, that's, that's Matthew. You have to click on your talk button. I don't know what's happening. Maybe Matthew is having problems on uh, with his internet. Okay, hold on. I'm going to try to send him a, a text message. It happens. No, I'm here. Sorry about that. Okay, you're back. Okay, great. I thought you had lost your internet connection. Okay, great. No problem. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. All good. Are you okay, Matt? Yeah, we are losing you again. I don't know what's happening. Matt, you? I don't know if you can hear us, but we have lost you again. Um, let's first see if, can you guys hear me? Like, can you please give me like a smiley or something like that? or? Uh, a thumbs up to make sure that you guys can hear me. Yes, you can hear me. So, okay, it's just, that's fine. So, uh, that's just, uh, Matthew is just seems to have problems on his side. Um, okay, I'm going to send him a text message. Hold on a second. Okay, he's joining. He's coming back. Perfect. I just saw Matt coming back in. Hold on a second. I'm going to give him... Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, hold on, Matt. I'm gonna. Can yeah, you hear this, me now? Yes, yes, Matt. We can hear you. Can you hear me? Hold on a second. Hold on a second. I'm gonna give you moderator's privilege. Okay, we are back in business. Yeah. 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 This. Thanks. Um. And just regarding the slides, what did I actually do? Not you. We keep we keep losing you. I don't know. I see that your microphone is on. But yep. we have, can yeah. You hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. It's strange because okay. we keep we keep losing you. So um, and I think the problem might be on your side, but I don't know what it is. But um, I think it might have been. I think it may have been a temporary thing. It's the first time we've had that. Yeah, yeah it's first time. Usually it works fine. I yeah. Think. So it started with the slides going blank. Yeah, I, in all honesty, I don't know what the problem is, except maybe that you have problems with your internet connection. If your internet is is slow or unstable, then um, then that 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 would be the reason. Okay, Matt? it appears to be back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Let's let's try. Let's let's see if it if it works or not. We see you moving. We see you moving your slides, so that seems to work. And is that moving them for you? Yes, it's moving them for us. Yes. Okay. Unfortunately, I can't see them, so I can't speak. <laughs> ah. Um, what? What much? I don't know what you've done, Matt. Um, is your page explorer open? You know the little window, the little page explorer. You have to make sure that the, there's a there's a little. Um, Okay, now you went, you went back nope. to application sharing. Not that one. 
working on that one, not that one, and not the whiteboard. So really, it's just not. Yeah, right now you went to application sharing. I mean, okay, I won't touch that again. You have to click on the little squiggly, uh, the icon in the top. Yeah, you now we are back. We can see your slides for sure. Yeah, very strange. Now, what can I do to get them back? Okay, so I'll just come up with. I think I have them. I think I have them handy anyway, so let me pull them up. So they are not moving on your site, Matt? No, not yet. Make sure that um, the little tick next to follow is, is there. I mean, you know, but that shouldn't be the problem. Mm -hmm. No, that's ticked. Now what we can do, if you want, we can go to application sharing and you could try to share your PowerPoint presentation. That's another option. But uh, it's not yeah, ideal. Just give me one second. I may have something. Yeah, I may almost be ready. I just need to get the, uh, just the Google Slides adjacent, and I should be able to do it. Yeah, I, I unfortunately don't know what's happening. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's something really strange, because I've never had that uh, that problem before, you know. Um, okay, I'm just queuing up to spatial. Play. I can I can move your slides no problem. Like they're they're working perfectly fine for me. I can move them no problem. Okay, can, can we just get um, spatial play? What number is that actually in our uh... spatial play? Um, hold on, spatial play is slide number nineteen, as I believe. Perfect. So number 20 is math is surprise and wonder and playing with numbers. Like, you know, special play would be num slide number nine, sorry, not 19, slide number nine. Okay, oops. Do you want me to go, you know what I can do? I can put special play on and yeah. then, uh, and then you, you know, I'll put it on for you. And then you you just have to click forward from from there. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to put special play on. Hold on. Okay, here we are. Special play. So it's slide number ten. Yeah. Sorry, I was misreading page number. It's definitely slide ten. So that matches. So that's fine. Yeah. I just thought the initial stuff was added as as slides. Yeah. Okay. So I'm. I'm moving to number eleven. So it should be math is surprise and wonder and playing with numbers. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so I just really feel, and I apologize, nothing like this has ever happened for me before. No, um, I'm But it's not like it can't, because it's a technological thing, so obviously it can happen. Um, the good news is participants have the slides, and participants stayed with us. It's great. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, okay, so uh, math is surprise and wonder and playing with numbers. That's, it's just something that I like to say. Um, the further you get into it, the more you'll find that you are surprised by things like the socks, which seems simple, but there's some some quite sophisticated thought involved, right? And playing with numbers is really, really important. You know, numbers aren't just to be operated on. I think they're to be played with. Okay, so yeah, I went to number 12, which is give me a problem, not an answer. Um, this one, I think if we ourselves see mathematics as a creative and generative process, then kids will as well. So just what's pictured on the screen is when uh, my son came home and it said, think of a math problem. So we don't always have to be the question askers. Um, we can be the students can be the problem posers as well. Uh, number 13, I'm just speeding up a little bit because we lost a bit of time and I had some interesting problems, but you can always review the slides. Yeah, so I wondered if we if we teach through worksheets or wonderings. And again, it's just a catchy phrase, but kids want to know about things like, you know, I wonder when or if pi ends, which of course it doesn't. 
But again, that's something that's surprising. So specifically, it's, it's an irrational number. Uh, number 14, this slide's really important to me because, again, it's us playing at home. And I don't make the boys play mathematics all the time, but sometimes we do. Um, specifically, the YouTube link, which actually is a 55-minute talk, is very important to me. It's called Mathematics for Human Flourishing. And so Francis Sue, it's his outgoing address, is Mathematics Association of America president. And so he's talking about a prisoner who he met, uh, so literally someone who's incarcerated, who taught himself mathematics. And I, and I guess as a way to be free when he became free, but to me, the point was, you know, it's something we can do with our minds that makes us free. Um, but also, he situates play as a basic human desire, one of just a few. And he says that play builds hope. And I said, sure, well, if play builds hope, then math play must build hope. <laughs> and then it may follow that math itself builds hope. At least I hope so. Um, and I think I included the link of the talk. It is 55 minutes, but I also included the text that she posted. Wonderful speech. Uh, interesting book by Mitchell Resnick of MAT, MIT and Scratch fame. Um, and he talks about learning, creative learning through passion, peers, projects, and play. And so he calls it lifelong kindergarten. And, I, and again, I've already made that point. Play doesn't stop. It doesn't have to stop just because kindergarten is over. I think I have just a couple points about that. You know, there's playing and there's playfulness. Uh, play pen. So imagine we give kids, like a complete kids, a completely closed-in problem. Or a playground that like give them actually room to play and solve an interesting problem. Uh, Mitchell Resnick's example is uh, Scratch, which he invented. But he has other examples like Minecraft. But I'm trying to translate it to the math classroom is, is what things are um, open enough to play with in creative ways. Uh, and he, he further talks about tinkering, iteration, and uh, try, try again. And we want that kind of classroom. Sorry, I had an advance to number 16, so it should be that one. The points that I just made. And number 17, so I asked the question, what would a pedagogy of playful mathematics look like? And the only thing I've seen that's, that's out there is Dr. Kathy Bruce did some work with the Math for Young Children project. And she talks about a guided play, so teachers leading kids through big ideas of mathematics. So they're not left on their own to just find it, but they're being guided through it. So kind of guided inquiry. And I came up with my own axioms for it. So axioms in mathematics are things that we either know to be true, you know, or they're already proven results, or they're things that we don't even have to think about. Like 1 plus 1 equals 2. You know, we could say that's axiomatic. Um, some people still might need to prove that. And indeed, there was a very, um, shall we say, literal-minded group um, out of France called the Bourbaki group. And they took 100 pages to prove that 1 plus 1 equals 2. But they were, shall we say, trying to write the complete book of mathematics. For most of us, we could say, OK, we accept that 1 plus 1 is 2. You know, We accept that multiplication works. So here are some that I think that we could accept. That humans are born to play. Um, that we can play to learn. You know, maybe not all learning is playful, but much can be. And that mathematical ideas are meant to be played with. Continuing on from there, playing and thinking are not at odds with each other. A playing state can be a thinking state. Um, you know, if you play board games at home, you probably know that to be true. But sometimes we think, well, okay, I'm playing, I'm not thinking. But those things are not so mutually exclusive. Um, all classrooms are thinking classrooms. Get kids talking, reasoning, thinking, and wondering as they learn mathematics. Even simple things like 2 plus 2 can be thought about. And you know, in the example, like, well, 2 digit by 2 digit multiplication, yeah, you're going to just use an algorithm for that somewhere along the line. But are you going to think about it along the way? 
I hope so. And just a couple more. Mathematics is full of surprises. Surprises are, by their nature, interesting. Uh, pedagogy of playful mathematics is hopeful. That all math classrooms should be playful. Okay, and I talk about um, what Kathy Bruce said. Should be slide 21. And embrace the mess of the problem solving process. Because why? Because thinking is messy. We want to get messy with it. Um, this one isn't posed as a question, but it could be. So why is seven most likely? I would like in the chat box, so let's say, okay, I'll try and phrase this precisely because I know we need it, and I'll get called on it. We roll two dice. Seven is the most likely outcome of the total of those two dice. Why is that true? And can we just get some reasoning? You may know this already, but if not, your intuition, your powerful intuition about why seven is the most likely outcome. And I would definitely say if you weren't shy about the socks, don't be shy about this one. Just say something about it. And depending on the grade or kids that you have, you may want to further say, ask them, is a 2 likely, is a 12 likely, to kind of get them thinking. Okay, so we can make a table of all possible outcomes. That is true. So we can make 7. So 7 would be diagonal on the table. That's a, a nice visual, mapping the outcomes. More numbers can be added to make 7. And I want to know, in grade four, let's say, would we need to take out a whole bunch of dice, roll them and experience it first, and then talk about the idea? Would we want to get students' intuition first, and then roll some dice? I don't think you can go wrong. I think if you structured as the investigation of making the table, mapping the outcomes, but I think, again, we have something that's kind of a big idea. So Melanie wants to map them all out, and that's great. But I think students of all age would have something to grab onto. You know, at our youngest of, of students, we could try going down to one days and experience that equal likeliness. Uh, you can even, there are all kinds of simulators out there on the internet or through apps that you could experience this as well. So for example, make a com computer flip a thousand times, or flip, excuse me, roll a thousand times, how many sevens? And kids can experience that. Okay, so we have more experience of it, and, and more experience of board games. So we may know that um, there's something about sevenness. Okay, but I, I do think that uh, kids will have some intuition as well. Uh, number 23 is just an example of where it's the game called Tenzi, so it's literally 40 dice in a tube. And I think it's a nice example of where the game itself is quite simple. You're trying to get, um, depending on the variation, you're trying to get the same thing to come up on all the dice. But so we were playing at home, and then it just led to questions like, questions came out of the play, like, how hard is it to get four of a kind when rolling ten dice? We can extend that, How go backwards, how hard is it to get three of a kind, how hard is it to get two of a kind? Or we can phrase it as more like, um, what, what usually happens when you roll ten? Um, so I think pictured we have three sixes. So I think it's quite common to get something like three of one, three of another, um, two of one, two of another. So it's an example of where the game itself can lead to some, some really, really interesting questions. 
and then um, really, really experiencing the probability. Yeah, so what we were trying to do, and it, it took a fair number of rolls to get a four. So I think the gameplay itself is experiencing the, the math concept. As I said, it's just 40 dice in a tube. So generally, if it's four people, you each have, have one color. But you don't need the fancy tube full of fancy dice. You could post that another way. Um, the next question has a GeoGebra simulation. It also relates mostly to probability. Yeah, it's a GeoGebra simulation, but I think there's a lot of different things like this out there. Because somebody just had to code a, a co code a coin flip, a 50-50. Um, so what's pictured is ten tails in a row. It's mathematically um, quite unlikely, but not impossible. And then, so I like to ask questions like, do you believe I just flipped ten heads in a row? I used to just do 20. But um, I used to do 20 instead, just to really dramatize it. And then... Um, what you could do is you could have kids um, flip their own. If you can handle the clattering of all the coins, actually, that is, for a few minutes, but, um, and record. And something really interesting to do is have them record as um, H's and T's. So you might have something like H, 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 T, 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 H, T, H, T. Um, so you ask kids to, to come up with... Uh, um, come up with a uh, real string where they flip 50 times and a fake string. And it's actually a true fact that you will almost always be able to look like a genius by telling them which one uh, they made up. So if they'll have made up something like HT, 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 HT. And the reason why is because it's 50-50. They'll assume that it would strictly alternate. But in reality, you might get like five heads in a row. So you look for the streaks, and you you seem like a genius. I definitely have not seen Liar's Dice. I don't think, anyway. It just reminds me that there's there's all kinds of um, big ideas at play. And that so the probability curriculum is a little... Um, it could be better, so it's a bit repetitive, and it's sort of not waters down the big ideas, but I think a lot of the sort of investigations and probability curriculum could be posed in a more interesting way. I think the mathematics of chance is some of the most interesting mathematics out there. Okay, and then I come to something like, this isn't the best picture. You might just go for a black and white chessboard. It happens to be the chessboard I own. But you could ask something like, how many squares are here? and have them play with it, and have a few chessboards in the room, or photocopied chessboards. And you could ask, how many squares are here? Actually, this one I would have to do again for myself, because um, the answer has slipped my mind. It's definitely well over 100. And so kids might tend to say, well, there is um, 64. And there sure is, but there's also a lot more than that. And so accounting for them um, gets quite tricky. But a good example of a nice, simple formulation, we can look at, uh, well, square numbers springs to mind, like as an investigation for grade 7, but it doesn't have to be that. It definitely doesn't have to be that. Okay, variations of this one. How would I vary this one? I can't think of one off the top of my head, but you could vary that one too. I'm trying to give you tasks where, depending on how you ask the question, it's a whole different task. And I think that's fun. Uh, next, this happened in our house. And just an example of where the, the play can be kind of low key. So Callum said 3 subtract 7 is 0. Uh, an example of where the play came from something that was said by a child. So 3 minus 7 is 0. And so I just needed to 
to draw that out and, and map it out. And we were trying M&Ms. And of course, you can't get into negative M&Ms. And so you take three away. And you haven't gone far enough. And so what I saw was this motivated the need, um, that motivated the need for negative numbers. And that's a really big idea, right? But if you think about it, you know, it's extremely cold today. So I don't think there's any kid in the world that couldn't handle, you know, integers on the thermometer. So would we need to hide that into grade 7 until grade 7 because curriculum? I don't think we necessarily do. But it's an example of where sort of the thing that was said motivated just playing with it. But then our construct was taking away, which is the most common version of subtraction that kids see, getting to zero, and requiring another tool. So after we drew the um, second half of the number line, so we started drawing to the left of zero. And so it just becomes natural that minus four is, needs to be the answer. This one, I've gone to the well many times to use this exact same slide, and that's just because it just happened in my house. And if you're listening and you have a thinking classroom, kids will give you stuff to play with. Anyway, Callum dumped his piggy bank. Kids do that. It was mostly pennies, but he said, I have infinity money. I have more than I can count. I have no idea how that happened. <laughs> but I thought, you know, that's a nice definition of infinity for a three-year-old. And this sort of triggered this whole investigation. I was saying, well, what would kids say if you said what is infinity? Or if you asked them what's the biggest number? Yeah, it really led me to that because I think a lot of number theory in general where we could really, really play with numbers is um, not really in the curriculum. Our curriculum is really sort of nuts and bolts and practical. Where's infinity in that? I don't know. But it should be there. And so the next slide just, in, in, just uh, shows what some grade sevens thought. And they had some nice ideas about it. I think particularly the infinity minus one is still infinity. I'd considered that they probably did a bit of Googling here. But I was OK with that. We want kids to feel like they want to go watch YouTube videos and learn about infinity. OK, so number 29, I do want you to put some ideas in the chat box. So, and I'll just tell you what I had in mind here. I first came up with this one because I was doing this um, Fermi problem session at OAME. So I'm going to just say, oh, barring the stock market crash. So we're just going to round them down to $90 billion. Poor guy. <laughs> so let's just say he wants to give away $90 billion. And let's give him some constraints. Let's make the constraint that he can't give away, I don't know, let's just say he can't give away more than, oh, I want to say a million dollars per day. And so if we give, kid, give kids that constraint, um, I think what we might want to do is give them, say, well, he has to give away the same amount every day. So I think 90 million, 90 billion he's down to. Um, so. Um, Jeff Bezos of Amazon fame is now the world's richest person. So, but Bill Gates, I checked the other day, he has over 90, million, 90 billion. And so, let's just give kids that rate. Let's just say it's a million per day. And I believe if you were to say he gives away a million per day, and he's about 55 now, no. Actually, it doesn't matter how old he is, but if he, assuming he doesn't make any more money, how long would it take? And actually, you know what? Like, just let's just say it's a million per day. Think about this. Thinking about the size of that number, just I'm just going to say 50 years, and I want some sort of estimates based on estimates based on your intuition. I feel like it would be less than 50. 
but can we reasonably put some some ideas in the chat box? Okay, so one million. Yeah, it would have to be one million per day. Otherwise, it's going to be a ridiculous length of time. I know I got tired too, but I'd want this one to be precise. So I think at one million per day is the number we want. You know why? Because a billion is a really, really big number, and he has 90 of them. Okay, so let's just, if we're all tired, let's just go through some of this. He gives away a billion dollars a day for 90 days, three months. He's done. Um, he gives away a million dollars a day. That's got to be 90 billions times a thousand, because each one is a thousand million. Um, so 90 thousand days. So are we? Are we in the? We're definitely in the range. 900 days to give away 1 million per day, assuming this fortune doesn't grow. Okay, and so we can experience the size of these numbers. Um, that's where I was going with this. Feel free to substitute Jeff Bezos. I actually had, it's either, yeah, I got tired too. I, I believe 90 times 1,000 or 90,000 days. But I'm not going to pull out a calculator this minute because it's. I'm trying to experience the size of the numbers. 90,000 we've got around. So, yeah, he's not going to be able to give his money away, sadly. Um, he's just not going to be able to. But I actually came up with one version where I was like, uh, would Bill Gates stop to pick up a $100 bill if he saw it on the street? But then I think, well, what's worth more, let's say, a million dollars? To Mr. Gates, or honestly, one dollar to me. That may be my maybe more with higher grades. Anyway, this section is about experiencing really large numbers. And this one, how many centicubes would fill the room that you are in? Desmos, linear relations, yeah. Somebody could build an activity in the activity builder. Once recently we were in a school gymnasium and I held up the cube and said, okay, well, how many Santa cubes? So depending on the size of the room that you're in, typically we'd think a classroom, probably the hundreds of millions. Again, we're talking experiencing those those really large numbers. Uh, I'm just going to leave that one there as a task idea. But variations could be, if you're looking at volume, capacity, filling the classroom as if it was a container. Um, it's around grade six, kids tend to struggle with um, so the idea of the cubic meter. So um, 100 by 100 by 100. So already there's a million little cubes in a cubic meter. So your average classroom could have, yeah, it could be over 100 million. Okay, I'll leave that one there. I, I do like that one a lot, though. Uh, this one actually, kids do interesting thinking here. You could try this one out tomorrow with very little prior knowledge. I made a multiple choice. How long would it take to count to a billion? Again, variations for smaller children, million, thousand, hundred, whatever. Okay, but we want them to do things like, okay, one, two, three, and so on. But then we want them to think about 999 million, 999,999. Because they want to say things like, well, it was, it's going to take um, a second for each, which would give you a ballpark. But again, the big numbers take longer than that. So we want them just thinking and modeling and then maybe adjusting their model. Okay, so that's one you could try tomorrow. This one, I wanted the whole group to try. 
just a really, really big point. Yeah, you could let this be some magic. You could blow some kids away. So the version I wanted was today, deal a deck of cards. So if you don't have one handy, just make sure it's, go get one, but then make sure it's shuffled. And then deal the first three. Okay, so there is a link to a Padlet. I wondered if you were able to um, just put the picture there. But if you didn't feel like that, you could just uh, double click on the screen and then you could put like, okay, King of Spades, Two of Hearts or whatever. So deal a deck of cards and show the first three. I'm sure there's an app for that too. But if you have a deck nearby... I'm just giving a couple minutes so you can just experience that. Yeah, type out the first three. So as as if king, I don't know, what's a good notation? Spades, two, hearts, five, clubs. Yeah, and if you want to email me so, then we can get a few in this presentation. So we probably don't have too many in there, or at least not yet. But even if we did, I don't feel like I really need to look to know that nobody dealt the same first card, or at least it would be unlikely if we did. So let me click on it and find out. Okay, so a quick look says nobody dealt the same first card. But I think just on that alone, you're probably going to know the, the size of the number that we're dealing with. So there's a very famous trick out there about uh, birthdays. And you only need a certain, like, fairly small number of people in the, in the room to actually guarantee that two people will share the same birthday. And it's way less than you would think. It's not 365 people. And that's the sort of surprise that mathematics can give us. Okay, so if you're still playing with the cards or not, this is what I was thinking here. Okay, let's visualize the size of this number. Visualizing is so underrated in our curriculum. I've come to realize this. So we get kids to represent mathematics. So as in the math process of representation, which I came across formulated nicely as the action being one of thought, representing some mathematics in our minds. And then, so that's the verb thinking, representing in the mind. And then the noun being the thing we've produced, like on paper. So usually we would be thinking of um, the opposite. But I, I just love that. So the action being of thinking. Now, think of 52 empty boxes and you're going to deal all the cards and, and they're going to go in that box. One in each. And so you turn over the first one and it's the ace of spades or whatever it is. And there's 52 left to place. So already, 
the best way to say it. So by the principle of multiplication, we're going to think of these 52 empty boxes. And we're going to take the 52 possibilities that can exist in the first box. We're going to go down to 51, because one's used up. Then we're going to go down to 50. So in other words, regardless of which cards they were, two are gone. And we keep counting like that. We'll get to zero. Okay? The multiplication principle is what we must use to account for all the possibilities. Um, so now we have 52 times 51 times 50, and so on. We'll have to get, uh, and all the way down to one. And so all of a sudden we have a number that's bigger than the number of atoms in the universe. So if you were, your deck of cards, if it was well shuffled, it's very likely that it has never been dealt before in the history of the universe, which is probably just this planet, unless aliens know how to play cards. Okay, so the number is just so astoundingly big that you can keep dealing cards and each deal of the cards can be unique. So of all the poker games and all the different games throughout time since the invention of cards, now that is a really big and massive idea. You know, and that's something you can, you can uh, blow kids' minds with for sure. Like there simply is just not that many atoms in the universe. The numbers get big quickly uh, when you multiply them. Very, very quickly. So, and I want you to think about, like, this ordinary thing, a deck of cards, how many different ways it can be played with. Practicing multiplication, practicing integer addition. Just have it handy and see what kids do. That's one thing. Um, but also know that uh, if you shuffle that deck well and deal it, it's unique in the history of the universe. Okay, so number 34 is really important because, yeah, that's number 34. Uh, mathematical objects, so big idea and a playful task is playful mathematics to me. So let's have some big and interesting idea at play. Ideally, you can attach it to an overall curriculum expectation. And that's playful mathematics. So mathematical objects are meant to be played with. The more open our questions are, the more open they are to being played with. And there's pleasure in thinking about mathematics. So at this point, as we reach towards the end, and if you're feeling that mentality, just put some ideas in the, um, the chat box about some things that you think might be played with in your classroom um, based on the strands you've been dealing with, the grade level, the big ideas in the grade, anything at all actually. And if, the, um, if we're feeling slightly fatigued, that's okay, too. Keep this mentality. Um, just be as specific as you feel like. Or just throw out some general ideas. I mean, this slide is just about leaving you with this, hopefully, with this mentality. I recognize after working all day, doing a bunch of thinking is not always Yeah, we play a lot of card games, Karen says. That's good. For war to practice operations. So I'm saying that there's games, like game games, where there's structured rules. And some kids would relate to that. And then there's just 
task. So that was, I just was finding that over time I wasn't really like a task, just a task. There has to be some big idea and a curriculum expectation. But I wasn't fussing or differentiating. I was just focused on posing decent and good questions. Okay, so now we have stuff like the actual KitKat with three people trying to grab it. Yeah, that's a classic sort of like Kathy Fosno does it with the sub. And yeah, I agree, that's something you can play with. We have lots of examples of board games. Totally key point, if whether it's war or shoots and ladders, like you know what's embedded, whether it's counting or, or adding and subtracting. So sometimes it's that purposeful practice. So sometimes it's attacking practice through play, which is a very important element. Because we don't have to attack practice through worksheets. Um, there will be one more I want us to play with, so just as you do that, we'll continue with the talking bits. Hundred squares are great for playing with the structure of numbers, and there's a rabbit hole of a link about to come up on your screen called isthisprime.com. It's going to flash you numbers, and I find it enjoyable to try and figure out which are prime. Like 91 seems like it should be prime, but it's actually 13 times 7. Um, 113 seems like it should be prime. Oh, no, I think 113 is. Anyway, there's some examples. So you get kids involved with skip counting, counting backwards, factors, multiples. You take those out. Um, what's left, the prime numbers, those atomic little bits that we're left with. Um, the numbers we use to build other numbers. And yeah, prime numbers are in the curriculum, but they're just plain interesting. And some people spend their whole lives on prime numbers. And I think we can get kids excited about it. There's some nifty simulators that will go up to a 1,000, and kids will be thinking, wow, it looks like there kind of should be a pattern there, but there's not. And there's a certain amount of mystery and interest you can build with prime numbers. I'm not going to go too deeply into detail, but I just think they're interesting. Uh, also a key point that 100 squares are helpful every step of, along the way for seeing pattern and structure. OK, here's a problem we can try. And we'll use our chat box and just put one like last burst of thought into it. This one, just call them McNugget numbers. There's actually another name for this problem structure. Um, the link that will be coming is to the original number file video on this. But maybe don't give it away. Make this your last act of thinking today. Um, and, and let's see if we can, we can get it. So if, if McNuggets only come in packages of 6, 9, or 20, which, by the way, I had to go to McDonald's and ask for the empty packages. Yeah, and it was weird, but they gave me three empty packages. Because I wanted to show them to kids, and then I got in trouble because it was unhealthy food. But there was luckily not actually any food in the package. So it was actually about numbers, not horrible unhealthy food. And so, yeah, and we're not really promoting the eating of the McNuggets. We're promoting the playing of with of numbers. And so... Um, 6, 9, and 20. Can you get exactly 43? And I know what you're going to say. No, you can't ask for just one. No, you can't ask for them to take one out. They're intact packages of 6, 9, and 20. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's the only way they'll do it. The shift manager says so. So can you make 43? Okay, and if you've convinced yourself that 43 is or is not possible, see if you can extend to 44. Um, you may want to, like, you could just quickly sketch on paper, sketch out some combinations. I'm not going to leave you hanging on this one, but I would love it if some thinking went in the chat box. So 
So this one, you want to ask kids, is exactly 43 possible? Okay, and the problem structure would work if it was, like, forget about McNuggets, if it was just something, and if it was, like, I don't know, 4, 6, and 12. So the problem would work the exact same way, by the way. When you pull that curtain away, um, I think the exact same idea is behind it. Okay, well, how about this? Yes or no hypothesis, and you get exactly 43. Oh, sorry, I wasn't scrolled all the way down. Yeah, so some people are thinking no, so working on it. Some people say no. We've noted, and this is where collective wisdom matters. Is oh yeah, Tim bits with this. That'd be cool. So okay, so we've got forty-two, and we've got forty-four. So I actually went out to a grade three and did this. And what you want is for them to start proving results. And the collective wisdom appears. Um, that collective wisdom of the room when you have a thinking classroom. So we're coming in pretty strongly on the no side for 43. And indeed, it's probably quite unlikely that I would give this exact problem structure if, unless the answer was no. But um, what does it matter that 42 and 44 are possible? Then we're going to extend it up to 45. Is it possible? So let's go with our no hypothesis for 43. Yes to 44, that's easy. Now, can we just get a couple more? Can we extend it to like 45, 46, 47? 45 is a yeah. Let's extend it up to 50 if we can, and then we're going to let our intuition kick in. 46, 47, good. So actually, all we need is 48. Yeah, we're good. 49. And I think we need 49, yes, and I think we need 50. And then the magic happens. Okay, so 50 should be... This is where I think if it's younger grades especially, yes, for 50, yes, it's proven. We'd want kids to have that hundreds chart. So now we start counting on and if we count on from 44, we get 50. If we count on from 45, we get 51, just using the 6. So guess what? Just using, I'm going to try and reveal this problem dramatically in the chat box. So just adding on with 6s from that point, we can get any integer. So, and yes, that means out to infinity. So think about it, and I'll go to the next slide so you can see what some grade threes did. Okay, keep in mind that I'm known to be the type of teacher where I, like I anticipate the kids work like we're supposed to, but there's always surprises. And I'm like, okay, I know this problem. I know that 43 is the largest number that you can't make with 6, 9, and 20. But kids started crossing them off, and all of a sudden, I'm the one looking at it. I'm like, oh, wait, 44 plus 6, 45 plus 6, 46 plus 6, 47 plus 6. We're never not going to be good, you know what I mean? And that's astounding, because you could walk up and you say, give me 111 chicken McNuggets, and there'd be some packaging that satisfies that. And that's just absolutely incredible. And you could ask for 1,111,823, and they could do it. And how does that even make sense? 
but it's possible just with 6, 9, and 20. And I mean specifically just with the prime factors of 6, 9, and 20. But what an astounding result. And so to prove something like that truly is thinking like little mathematicians. So 43 is called the Frobenius number of 6, 9, and 20. And you could come up with your own problem version. We heard about Timbits, and you could say, well, the Frobenius of the Timbit packages, or the Frobenius of, of anything at all. And actually, if you look on uh, Wolfram Alpha, um, for, you can ask for Frobenius of any, any three numbers. And Frobenius number will be the largest number that cannot be made. You know, and 43 and below, there's actually a fair number that you can't make. I cannot believe you can have 37 McNuggets, for example. But everything after 43, that's where mathematics astounds us and, uh, and uh, really blows us away. Um, do watch that number file video. He's a good one. Um, it's a good one. And if you pose a Frobenius number problem, um, tweet me some pictures. I would love to see that. And that just goes to show, like, it's that structure. So you could hide that structure ten times in a row. Oh, kids would start to pick up on what you were doing. But you could probably hide it several times in a row. And they wouldn't notice. And the magic would be there. Um, 38 is just a little plug for a logical mathematical game called Set. Actually, they have a few different games. And they have an app, and they also have a problem of the day app. So what you do is you are trying to make sets of three based on the attributes. So whether they're solid, striped, or empty, so the shading, the shape, and the number. And just based on that, uh, by the way, there's like all kinds of mathematical papers, so at least several written on this game, because it's really intense mathematics. But wow, you want to get kids thinking mathematically, um, you can get them, uh, get them playing, get them playing set. Can we, as, as we get towards the end, if there's any games that uh, you want to put in the chat box that are great for getting kids to think mathematically, any any links that you have handy, feel free to feel free to do so. Any questions you want to ask? So I ended up at the, the last slide, so we'll have a bit of a chance to answer any questions at the end. So the last slide is about, uh, you know, I once went out last fall and I, I got kids playing with binary numbers. So if you're only allowed the digits 0 and 1, like the computer you're using right now, how do you count? And there's just a little screen capture. I just found a little app because I was learning along with the kids. So we get interesting things in binary, like 31 is 111111. So 11,111. It's not that. It's just 11111. And so just getting kids thinking just that a little differently a little bit differently about numbers. And I was wondering on that note, if we were to play math like an octopus, it would be natural for that octopus to use base 8, so to use the digits 0 through 7. And then they'd have to regroup at 7, right? Just like in binary, we group after 1, because we're not allowed to. But so the octopus, with its 8 appendages, would really want to a base 8 or octal system. We like tens, I think, for reasons that are quite obvious. 
but there's been other cultures around the world based on 20 or even or even 60 for various reasons. You know, depending how those cultures count and how they see numbers. And I think that's a nice, maybe a nice point about culturally responsive mathematics. So bringing in mathematics, kids might know from, um, you know, if they have recently immigrated or their parents have. It's just something that's interesting to think about. Um, but also, just get us thinking differently about numbers um, to get us playing. Um, I'm feeling like that's just about it for me, and I'm I'm going to stay and answer any questions. I appreciated the. Um, I know that uh, I was getting you to think, and I don't enjoy sort of like spoon feeding people. <laughs> so there's enough of that in the world. And so I just thought, well, okay, um, how can I get them thinking? But then I didn't want you thinking I'm some kind of expert on this. So I thought, well, I, let's present just a variety of things that I think are playful. And then you can go and you can either use these things or use the sort of spirit or mentality. And um, that's the most important thing. Mathematics is meant to be played with, and so don't let us think that play just ends in kindergarten or it's just for phys ed class. Let's get kids playing with mathematics. Yes, because math is play. Um, I'll stay on for for any questions and, uh, as we finish up, but I do want to thank you very much, and especially for staying through the uh, little technical problem. Uh, we appreciate it lots. Okay, thanks so much, Matt. Uh, I must admit that uh, Matt's sessions are always full of surprises, uh, to say the least. <laughs> and, yeah. and Matt, you're always great at keeping cool under pressure, thankfully, because... Uh, I was? You know, you were, you were, really. I, <laughs> I was a little anxious for a while, but... Uh, I know, you're getting, uh, so, can I say what I think that was? Mm -hmm. And anyone can just chime in if they've experienced this. So I have Rogers. And there's the main network, and there's one that is the same network name but 5G. So once in a while it hops on to 5G, which I don't believe the 5G protocol or whatever is even exists yet, does it? No, it does, but actually 5G is supposed to be faster, but hmm. it doesn't reach as far in your house. So if you are, if you are further away from your router, you are better right. not to use 5G. If you're in the same room, you could use 5G. So 5G only works when you're really close to your router, but the further away you go, uh, yeah. you're, you're better off not using the 5G. That, that's See, Melanie good. has that problem too. What's weird is I am in the same room, yeah. so there's, there's literally nowhere in the house that 5G works. So yeah. in my head, it was like, well, it's the next generation, but you're saying it's not even that. Wow. So, because I am in the same room. <laughs> but yeah, I, so once I, in a while, it tries to hop to 5G. Yeah. Uh, pretty rarely. That could be the problem. I, I don't use it. I, I honestly don't use it uh, myself because I uh, I find that it's more trouble than it's worth, so I, I usually yeah, don't exactly. use it. Myself. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, thanks, thanks anyway for thinking about splitting your screen and uh, and working blind through the session, so that worked really well for us uh, at the end. Yeah, so I split uh, it. it. At, I one point, uh, at one point, Danity was sharing a picture, and, and you couldn't see it, so that was a little funny oh, because cool. Danity oh. was here. But it doesn't matter. Yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, so um, I, was, I was also thinking that... Um, um, you know, another mathematical question that would be really interesting and funny is that if you're meeting the Prime Minister of Canada and he's wearing a grey suit, what's the probability that his socks will be grey, orange, green, or yellow? Because you know, <laughs> you know what I'm you know what I'm talking about. I, I I'm trying to yeah. find I'm trying to find one here. I would say that the probability is that it's probably going to be uh, yellow and blue <laughs> or something. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I anyway. think they were like rubber duckies the other day. Yeah, rubber ducky and all of that. And <laughs> that's quite funny. 
Anyway, uh, thanks so much, Matt. I, I, uh, I, we have a few more people in the room. I just need a, a couple more minutes to do my little spiel at oh, the yeah, end. I'm going to do, yeah. do that very, very quickly. Um, it's going to take another two minutes, but uh, anyway, we have lots of interesting sessions coming in the in the coming days. And you know what? Um, I'm not going to go through them because you know it's really late. But I would recommend that you guys just go to our calendar. Uh, and I'm going to paste that link and I will provide it to you also tomorrow. And you can just go and look at the upcoming sessions. We have a, a lot of good ones on mathematics actually in the coming days. I also want to remind you guys that um, if you are, um, if you have completed a qualification course in mathematics, technology or kindergarten, you can actually apply for a $450 subsidy. And I'm going to provide that link for you guys as well if you wanted to apply for that $450 subsidy. Uh, also want to remind you, when leaving Blackboard, you will be presented with a feedback survey. Uh, if you can just take a few minutes to fill it, fill it up, that would be great. And um, after that, you will be redirected to another page where you can enter your name, and you will then get a certificate of participation that you can add to your um, to your um, resume, to your um, uh, professional resume. Um, I'm going to provide you with the links also to the feedback survey and to the certificate of participation in case um, in case you're not redirected, but you should be redirected. And I'm also going to paste the link for tonight's session, and it will be live. I will upload the recording in an hour or two, and it will be live uh, later tonight or at least by tomorrow. Okay, so I want to thank you all uh, for um, for your time once again. Uh, Melanie, I thought that your uh, comments were really funny when you said that, uh, uh, that the socks needed to be clean. I suspect that you must be the mother of a teenage boy because I have a teenage boy and he couldn't care less. So that was a, a very funny comment. And um, that's it. So I just want to... Um, uh, thank you all once again, and um, wish you all a very good evening, and um, thank you for your participation, and we certainly hope to see you soon again on OTF Connects. Donc, uh, bonne fin de soirée à tous et à toutes, il y a des francophones parmi nous, et uh, à très bientôt sur OTF Connects. Merci beaucoup.